PCOS Myth Busting. Webinar recording hosted by the Alliance and Scottish Government. And um, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Irene Oldfather. I'm director here at the Health and Social Care Alliance. I'm delighted to be able to welcome you today to this session that we have on polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by our women's health champion, Professor Anna Glazer. Um, Anna, thanks so much for uh, for joining uh, today. And, and actually, um, the Alliance works very closely with Scottish Government and um, supporting uh, the Women's Health Plan. Uh, and, and, you know, Anna's indicated that, and we'll hear from her in a few minutes, that um, polycystic ovary syndrome is one of her uh, key priority areas um, for her term. And also we're joined by Professor Colin Duncan from Edinburgh University. And I'll say a little bit more as I introduce our speakers later in the session. But we're pleased to, to have our um, BSL interpreter, Jackie. Thanks so much, Jackie, for being with us today and Claire Mills from Listen, Think and Draw, who's doing a sort of live um, drawing and, and visually supporting the session. And we found this has worked very well in the past and gives us a kind of visual record of, of what we talk about today. Um, so we're looking forward um, to seeing Claire's work at the end. And thanks, Claire. Um, for joining us today. So I'm just looking, we, we still got a few people coming into the room, but um, I could maybe just, you know, take us through a few uh, issues. Um, as I say, the Alliance works with uh, the Scottish Government team and the Women's Health Plan. And, you know, part of what we do, we hope, is about taking the stigma uh, out of women's health and about kind of demystifying some of the mythology around terums and, and you know what women's health is about and we know that for example one in ten women and I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about that do um, have polycystic ovary syndrome and I'm sure you know that that's actually an underrepresentation of the numbers but um, part of what we want to do today is to raise awareness um, about how people can, you know, access effective and timely support and kind of debunk some of the myths and mystery and misinformation around um, this particular aspect of women's health. And really today, I mean, what we want to do is to learn a little bit more about um, the issues around polycystic ovary syndrome. But one thing I would say is that it, it won't be possible today to give out individual medical advice. Um, so please bear that in mind um, as we go through the session. And, and we see today as part of a series that we've um, undertaken on, on women's health, particularly menstrual health, which is a priority area on the plan. And we've hosted two other webinars um, with a focus on periods and period related problems. Um, and we always like to hear from you. So this is a two way conversation. Um, so we want to hear from you about uh, any questions that you have or even things that you would be interested in for future for future meetings. So now to our um, our main speaker today. Well, we've got two really main speaker. So um, our, our, our person who I think has been the instigator of the session today, I would say, because this is one of Professor Glazer's real interests, our women's health champion, Professor Anna Glazier. And I'm sure she's known to you, but um, she's internationally renowned in the field of reproductive medicine. We're delighted to have her today. And she's currently honorary professor at the Centre for Reproductive Health at the University of Edinburgh. And, and as I say, Scotland's Women's Health Champion. So Anna, I know you were particularly keen to have this session today. So over to you for your introductory remarks. Thank you, Irene, and good afternoon, everyone. I should admit that sitting here, I'm worried that Claire is about to do a little drawing of me. Um, so stay clear, Claire. <laughs> so I think you all know that the Women's Health Plan, which was published nearly two years ago now, recognizes that women and girls experience various health needs and risks during their lives, which are not the same as those of men. And of course, polycystic ovarian syndrome is one of these conditions. 
it is one of the most common hormonal disorders or the most common endocrine hormonal disorder in women. And I decided to focus on it as one of my particular interests within the Women's Health Plan, although not to the exclusion of other things, for three reasons. And the first reason is that it affects women at all stages of their lives. And thinking back over the years when I used to see patients in my clinic with polycystic ovarian syndrome, I would see teenagers who came with acne, young women who were worried about excess hair growth or hirsutism, older women who were struggling with heavy periods, women who were having difficulty getting pregnant because as we know, polycystic ovarian syndrome is associated with increased ovulation. And although many people think that once you get through the menopause, polycystic ovarian syndrome goes away, it actually doesn't. It, changes with aging from a reproductive disorder to a metabolic disorder and women with polycystic ovarian syndrome are at increased risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease including hypertension and high cholesterol and an increased risk of heart attack and throughout the life of course it can affect women's mental health so there's a long list of reasons why it's important that I should be interested in polycystic ovarian syndrome. But the second major reason for taking an interest is that I feel that women with PCOS don't have the same voice that women with other conditions have. Um, and I'm always congratulating the endometriosis lobby for the work that they do in, in making sure that women with endometriosis have a very loud voice in government and in healthcare. And I think women with polycystic ovarian syndrome do not have that voice. And then the third and final reason is because I think polycystic ovarian syndrome is a complicated condition. It's often misunderstood, even by women that have it and by healthcare providers. And there are lots of myths surrounding it, which is really why we're here today. So, I'm not really the major speaker in this session. The major speaker is going to be Professor Colin Duncan, who has an international reputation for being an expert in polycystic ovarian syndrome. And Irene is asking Colin to dispel some of the myths um, that surround polycystic ovarian syndrome. And so we hope that by the end of this session, you will all feel better informed and will have a clearer idea particularly if you have polycystic ovarian syndrome, about what that really means for you and your health. So I'm going to hand over to Professor Duncan and Irene to do a double act with the myth busting. Anna, thank you very much. And, and what a great introduction to Professor Duncan. Um, and as you said, he's a renowned um, expert in the field of reproductive medicine and particularly PCOS. So we're really delighted um, to, to have you with us today, Professor Duncan. And I, I think we'll just go straight over to you and then we'll open up for questions and conversation after that. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. So my job today is to try to bith, uh, uh, bust some myths about polycystic ovary syndrome. And I'm going to start off with the first myth. And the first myth is that people with PCOS have cysts on their ovaries. So what is PCOS? So here's a scanner. And if you look at this picture here on the left-hand side of the screen, that is a normal ovary. And you can see these little black dots in the normal ovary. And these are eggs which are starting to grow. And this on the right side of the screen is a polycystic ovary. It's not much different in size, but what you can see is see these little black dots. These, there's a lot more of them. And in a polycystic ovary syndrome, you'll count more than 20 of these little black dots, which are the sacs where the eggs live. So polycystic ovary syndrome has just got a lot of paused eggs. And so in polycystic ovary syndrome, there are no cysts, just an increased number of these paused eggs in the ovary. Now, when you look um, at polycystic ovary uh, syndrome, it's not just about having a polycystic ovary. 
So there are three things that are involved in the diagnosis. One of them is the polycystic ovary on the scan. Another one is increase in male type hormones or the effects of male type hormones, which can be on the skin with spots or extra hair. And the other one is irregular periods and irregular menstrual cycle. And in order to have polycystic ovary syndrome, you need to have two out of three, these three uh, features. Now, how common is a polycystic ovary? Well, if you look at all of the women with reproductive uh, years and do a scan of their ovaries, one in every five women will have what's classified as a polycystic ovary with all these little paused eggs on it. So one in five women have got polycystic ovaries, but not all of them have got polycystic ovary syndrome. So polycystic ovary syndrome, probably about 40% or up to 50% of these patients have actually got something else, the period problems or the increased male type hormones or both of them to have polycystic ovary syndrome. So polycystic ovary syndrome, which is present in between 8 to 10% of, of women. So the first myth is to say that there are no cysts in the ovaries of polycystic ovary syndrome, just paused eggs. And because there are no cysts, it's not associated with pain or an increased risk of ovarian cancer. Not everyone with PCOS has polycystic ovaries because you can have polycystic ovary syndrome with two out of the three with the increased male type hormone and their regular periods without there necessarily being these polycystic ovaries. And most of those with polycystic ovaries don't have ovary syndrome. But removal of the ovaries does not cure PCOS because PCOS is where the ovaries are in an environment that they get confused. And the ovaries get confused and that therefore, rather than growing and releasing eggs, they'll pause the eggs, which you can see on the scan. The next myth that I want to bust is if you've got irregular periods, you've definitely got PCOS. Now we've already seen that irregular periods is just one of the features of PCOS and irregular periods by itself does not mean you have PCOS because you have to have something else, increased male type hormone or the polycystic ovaries on a scan or all three. So why does the womb have periods in the first place? Well, the womb doesn't have periods because it feels like it, it needs to be told to have periods. And it's told to have periods by hormones that come from the ovary. And there are two hormones that come from the ovary saying grow a lining, and then another one that says stabilize that lining and then get rid of the lining. And the ovary does that when it grows and releases eggs. So if you're having irregular periods, you're not growing and releasing eggs regularly. And the ovary doesn't do that because it feels like it. It's told, and it's told by a couple of hormones that come down from the brain to say, grow, sort of grow an egg and release an egg. So in polycyst, in somebody who's got an irregular periods, there's only three reasons why that might happen. Reason number one is if the ovary is running out of eggs. And that means the signals from the brain are telling the ovary to grow eggs, but there's not many eggs there. And so the signals to the womb are becoming a bit more irregular. Okay, And that's one reason for irregular periods. Another reason is that the signals from the brain are, are on the lower side. So, so it means that the ovary doesn't quite get told what to do all the time. And so the signals to the womb becoming a bit irregular as well. And the third reason is where the signals from the brain are, are out of balance. And, and then the ovary finds itself with, with out of balance signals and gets confused and it signals to the lining of, of the womb in a confused way. And that's polycystic ovary syndrome. So looking at the lining of the womb down a microscope across the course of a 28 day cycle. And what you can see is this is the microscope looking at what's happening in the womb. And what you see is that the lining of the womb thickens up and then it stops thickening up and stays the same. And it changes, it changes down the microscope. And what that does is the first element of it is growing and then it stops growing and it prepares for pregnancy. And the growing is because of a hormone called estrogen. And the stopping growing and preparing for pregnancy is called a hormone called progesterone, 
which is present once you've released an egg. And if there's not a pregnancy, the progesterone will fall, the womb will get signals to say there's no pregnancy, and therefore it'll come away and it'll go right the way back to the start. So that's what happens in a normal cycle. In polycystic ovary syndrome, what happens is the ovary doesn't release an egg regularly. So there's estrogen, but no progesterone. So what you can see is the lining of the womb just keeps on growing, okay? It doesn't stabilize and it doesn't get these nice signals to stabilize and the signals to tell it to come away. And so therefore, what happens is that that means that sometimes when it comes away, it comes away as a really heavy period that goes on for a long time. So irregular periods suggest irregular growth and release of eggs from the ovary. PCOS is a common cause of irregular periods, but there are other causes. In PCOS, the irregular bleeding can be heavy and prolonged. And because of that growth of the lining of the womb, it's important to have a period every now and then. So those with PCOS need three or four periods a year to keep the womb lining healthy. And that can be achieved by, by taking some progesterone for a short time to stabilize the lining of the womb. And then when that progesterone disappears, when you stop taking the tablets, a normal period will occur. So the next myth is about everyone with polycystic ovary syndrome will sort of gain weight. Now, we know that we've got a bit of a hormone imbalance that confuses the ovary, and that hormone imbalance is exaggerated by weight. So if you gain weight, polycystic ovary syndrome will get worse. And there's a hormone of storage which is higher in polycystic ovary syndrome, and that's called insulin. And when you've got high levels of the hormone of storage, polycystic ovary syndrome gets worse. But if you've got high levels of the hormone of storage, it means it's easier to gain weight. And these can work in a vicious cycle to make polycystic ovary syndrome worse. And that's all about metabolism. So polycystic ovary syndrome has got the hormone imbalance, but it's also got a metabolic imbalance that interacts with that hormone imbalance. So let's talk about weight problems in polycystic ovary syndrome, because we know that in some countries, particularly in America, sort of, uh, over 65% of patients with PCOS are obese. Not quite as many in Europe, but there are definitely weight problems in PCOS. And if you look at those with PCOS, they're more likely to be overweight or obese. And why is that? Well, you have to look at energy balance. And energy balance means that you take in food and you use up energy. And if you take in what you use up, then things are in balance and your weight is stable. If you take in too much, you will tend to gain weight. Or if you don't lose enough, if you don't use as much of energy, you will tend to lose weight as well. And those with PCOS don't necessarily do any different diet or any different exercise from anybody else, and yet they tend to, to gain weight. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about why that is. The first thing to say is if you look at energy expenditure, that exercise, the expenditure, only really accounts for 20% of the energy you expend every day. 65% of the energy you expend every day is just in staying alive, your heart beating, your, your blood circulating, your brain thinking. And that leaves 15%. And that 15% of energy expenditure is what's called adaptive energy expenditure. That means that if you've taken in too much, your body will burn it off and get rid of it. Okay? And that, that adaptive energy expenditure is just using up energy to get rid of it. And that usually puts your temperature up. And if you look at, and particularly after eating, so if you notice that when you've had a big meal, you'll sometimes notice yourself a bit hot and sweaty. And what that is, is the body burning off the excess calories that you might not need. So in polycystic ovary syndrome, the energy expenditure that you burn off is down by a quarter. And that's a function of polycystic ovary syndrome, whether or not you're overweight or whether or not you've got normal weight or whether you're obese. Your, your ability to burn off the calories is reduced by 25%. 
So therefore, it gives you this little deficit here in green, which means you have to eat about four or five percent less every day to be the same as anybody else, or you have to exercise 20 percent more to be the same as anybody else. And some people will achieve that without any problem, and other people struggle, and that means that they'll gradually gain weight. So weight gain makes polycystic ovary syndrome worse, and weight loss makes it better. Many of those with PCOS are not overweight or obese, but it is harder to lose weight in PCOS. Exercise improves PCOS even if without weight loss, and there are strategies to help facilitate weight loss in PCOS, particularly the, the food you eat, the timing of when you, you take that food. And generally, it's small, healthy meals regularly and taking more calories early in the day rather than later in the day. The next myth I want to bust is that PCOS makes you infertile. Well, in order to achieve fertility, you have to release an egg. And we know that in PCOS, eggs are not released regularly, but that doesn't mean to say they're not released. And so that means that in polycystic ovary syndrome, eggs will be released every now and then, and you won't have the luxury of knowing when that fertile time might happen. As women get older, their hormones change, and actually ovulation and growing and releasing eggs improves with age. And so it's very unusual to see somebody in their, in their late 30s and 40s with polycystic ovary syndrome in the clinic. Their periods are often a little bit better than those in their 20s and, 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 and early 30s. Now, one of the other things to say is that as you get older, your fertility will improve. But one treatment that is often used in polycystic ovary syndrome is the pill. The pill will give the hormones to the womb to carry on having the periods, but the pill switches off the signals to tell the ovary what to do. Now, when you stop the pill, the signals for, to, to tell the ovary what to do will come back in again. And actually, the first month or two after stopping the pill, these signals haven't quite got time to get out of balance. And so those with PCOS have increased fertility compared to normal after stopping the pill. And then it'll take a bit longer, but then the hormone imbalance will happen and the, the problems of polycystic ovary syndrome will occur. So with regards to fertility, contraception is required if pregnancy is not desired. Fertility treatment, if required, is simple, will return fertility normal, and will does not usually involve IVF. Weight can affect access to fertility treatment, so it is important to ensure that, that, that weight management uh, during sort of any form of management is important. And spontaneous ovulation increases with age and immediately after stopping the pill. And the final myth I want to bust is that PCOS symptoms cannot be sort of improved. So as we've heard already, PCOS is a lifelong condition. And the things that we do in PCOS depends on what the problems are. So we can't cure PCOS. All we can do is focus on the problems at different times of life. It might well be that area of life, the crucial thing is education and explaining about PCOS. And that's what we're trying to do a little bit uh, today. We know that weight management is important uh, and weight management is important throughout life because keeping a healthy weight will, will make sure that the problems with PCOS are markedly reduced. It's hard to do, but it, but it is certainly something to think about and there are strategies that, that can help with that. Obviously, there's contraception, and contraception will help stop a pregnancy, but also some types of contraception, particularly the pill, will switch off the ovaries and make a lot of the symptoms of PCOS uh, reduced. We've got uh, fertility treatments, and as I said, fertility treatment is something that we're very, very good at, to the extent that if a woman comes to me with fertility issues with polycystic ovary syndrome and their weight is within the limit of treatment, I can guarantee that we can get her to grow and release eggs. Unfortunately, we can only use the medications that do that for a short time. So we have to keep that up our sleeves until fertility is important. 
We've heard already that menstrual health is important and throughout the, the reproductive years, it's important to ensure that there is at least three or four periods a year to keep the womb healthy in the absence of taking hormones such as progesterone. And then later in life, what we've got is, is screening for, for potential problems, preventing those problems, and obviously giving support. So PCOS just not just does not just affect the reproductive years. We've got good medicines to improve menstrual health, skin health, and fertility. Weight management is very important. And the way that I explain to women with PCOS is that lifelong health is worse if you have obesity and no PCOS than if you have PCOS without obesity. And a lot of people will read about diabetes and worry about that. But the crucial thing is, if you have obesity without PCOS, things are worse than if you have PCOS without obesity. And we're pretty good at dealing with these things at the time that people come to see us. There are some things that we're not good about, and that's why sort of the uh, Professor Glazier is focusing on them. So eating problems, sleep problems, and mental health problems are more common in PCOS, and we should get better about inquiring about them to allow appropriate support and treatment. We should screen for and use preventative strategies for long-term conditions that have an association with PCOS, such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease, and we're not as good at doing that, and that's certainly something that we, we need to get better at, and I know that that's one of Professor uh, Glazier's priorities. And when it comes down to PCOS, if you search for NHS Inform PCOS, you'll get uh, some information on PCOS and a little animated video that we've, we've done. You can also look at the other NHS sites for polycystic ovary syndrome. And this is, this is a little academic uh, article that I've written on how to teach about polycystic ovary syndrome to uh, junior medical students or healthcare practitioners to try to get them to understand it because as Professor Glazier said, it's quite a complicated condition that sometimes people don't quite understand. So with that, I'm going to pass as, over to uh, the chair and hopefully the myths have been busted. Oh, and thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, and can I compliment you in the very uh, understandable way that you, you undertook that presentation so that even as lay people um, were able to get the gist of it? There's quite a lot to take in there, though, um, and, and we do have quite a few questions coming up. Um, and, and some of them I can tell that you've you've already sort of described a little bit, but but maybe we could just go through um, a few of them if that's okay, Professor Duncan. So so one was about, and you, you did refer to this in relation to contraception and fertility, but you know, so the question from Olivia is: Is it okay to to use contraception to manage PCOS, or or is that bad for the lining of the womb? Okay. No, the contraception is good for the lining of the womb. So, so the problem in PCOS is a lack of progesterone. Okay, and that means that the estrogen will thicken and thicken and thicken the lining of the womb. Now, the pill which has got progesterone in it, or the mini pill which has got progesterone in it, or the coil with progesterone in it, or the implant with progesterone in it, will make sure that the, that lining of the womb doesn't grow. And sometimes it doesn't grow enough to have periods but as long as there's progesterone, taking progesterone by tablet or any other way, that means that you don't have to worry about the lining of the womb. The problem about the lining of the womb is if you have oestrogen, which you'll have naturally without any progesterone, then you need to take progesterone by, as, a, as a drug with medication. That, that drug can be in the coil. Irene, could I just chip in here? I think that quite a lot of women who go to see their GP with problems with their period and who are advised to take the pill feel that they're being fobbed off. I think there is this view that the pill is promoted as a cure for any women's health problem. So I'd just like to reiterate what Professor Duncan said that actually for women who have polycystic ovarian syndrome, the combined pill or all the other progesterone-only methods that Professor Duncan mentioned are in fact extremely good 
ways of treating polycystic ovarian syndrome if a woman doesn't want to get pregnant. And the added advantage, I think, of the combined pill for women with PCOS is that it is beneficial for treating acne by itself. So I think it's important that women don't feel fobbed off when they're offered the pill. I think it is actually a thoughtful way of treating PCOS. I don't know whether you'd like to add anything to that, Colin. Yes, I think so. There are there are um, pills that we can use, and any pill will improve the skin problems of PCOS because the ovary is switched off, and these little paused eggs and the ovary will produce a little bit extra male type hormone. And by switching off the ovary, that male type hormone will lower, and that's what the, the, it's a male type hormone that causes issues with the with the with the with the skin. The 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 the, the pill is better at switching things off. Uh, and because it's got some estrogen in it, that is also beneficial in counteracting some of the male hormone effects. Uh, but the mini pill can switch off the ovaries to a degree. It, it has some beneficial effects on the skin, but perhaps not as many. And, and we can got, we've got, I was going to say, we've we got. Carry on, Colin, sorry. No, I was just going to say, there are some pills that, 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 that we can add male hormone blocker to or have got a little bit of male hormone blocker in that can that can help a little bit if the, the normal pill isn't behaving, it's, it isn't working as well as we'd like it to. And perhaps we should just add that you said it early on in your presentation that women with polycystic ovarian syndrome should have three or four periods a year to protect the uterus from the effects of lack of progestogen. But I think it's also true to say that women who are taking the combined oral contraceptive pill, if they want to, can take it continuously and not have any periods, and they still get the benefit from the progesterone, but they don't have to have periods if they don't want to. Do you agree with that? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and some people will take it continuously. Some people will take it for a tricyclet or something along those lines. So they maybe have three or four periods a year, uh, which are artificial periods on the pill. Thanks, Colin. And thanks, Anna, because I think that's helpful amplification of, of you know, how women do feel and, and, and particularly around the contraception, um, you know, that it's just a, a, a solution for everything. So it's really helpful to have that um, additional amplification. Um, Professor Duncan, there are quite a lot of questions coming up around weight. Um, maybe I could try and go through uh, a few of them. And... Um, there's a question around, obviously, you've talked about how PCOS can improve with weight reduction. Um, there's a question, is it curable with weight reduction? Um, are there are also questions around how much weight would I have to lose to see improvements? I don't know if that's something you okay. can answer because okay. I suspect okay. it's a bit individual. Okay, so, so to deal with the, the, the first thing is, can PCOS be cured? Well, PCOS is never going to be cured, but it is very likely that there are people with very mild PCOS or just polycystic ovaries without the polycystic ovary syndrome, that as they gain weight, they move into the spectrum of polycystic ovary syndrome. So I often see somebody whose periods were absolutely fine, maybe had a baby, gained a bit of weight, and then they were diagnosed with polycystic ovary syndrome. And then if they get their weight back down to the level it was before they conceived previously, the old periods will go back to normal. And with regards to sort of uh, how much weight do you need to lose, there was a really good study that was done in Australia. And what they did was they, they called it the Fertility uh, Fitness Clinic. And what they did was is that they had women who were obese and they enrolled them into a program where they had a lot of dietary support, they had exercise support, and, and half of the women in that program carried on the program and half of the women didn't, didn't engage with it. So they didn't randomize people, but the people who didn't engage with it didn't lose any weight and none of them released an egg. And the people who lost weight, uh, even although they were still obese, so they're, they're, they lost weight, and they were still obese, every one of, or 90% of them released an egg by themselves. And, and the, 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 the ideal, it looks as though 10% of body weight was the level that, 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 that produced 
the best the best effects more than 10 or 10 percent or more of body weight thank you thanks I, th I think that's helpful um and then there's a question about required weight limits um for someone who has pcos for fertility treatment okay. is there okay. a, is there a threshold there okay so 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 there the intra i think probably the best thing to say is is that there's currently a study which is looking at the best tablets to use for fertility and PCOS. We know that there are several tablets that we can use, and what we're doing is comparing one tablet with another. So, so it's it's in that study is recruiting in Scotland, and the and and that has to be a BMI of less than thirty five. Okay, so that is for that study. Now, the the weight limit for IVF is a BMI of thirty, and so and so there are some health boards. That, that stick with that same limit for PCOS. But the study, which is going to give us the biggest information, has got an upper limit of a BMI of 35. Thank you. I mean, that's that's very helpful indeed. And it's good to have your research expertise. I know that's one of your, your real areas of interest. Um, now, we've got quite a few questions around, um, you know, whether there's a spectrum in PCOS. And so we've got Stuart Lennox um, talking about, and, and someone else actually, if you have, you know, Stuart's question is around if you have slightly raised androgens, but normal um, blood results uh, and a normal uh, ultrasound. And someone else is asking about if you have a normal ultrasound, normal periods and BMI normal, but raised androgens. Um, it, is it possible that there's a spectrum here? Because some people are saying it, it, it appears that you get dismissed as not having PCOS yeah. if, if you, yeah. you know, if you're okay on some of the tests but not all yeah. of them. Well, I think that, that that there is definitely a spectrum, and I think that probably one in five women are on that spectrum. But you can see that there are some women who just get a regular period, some women who just get increased male type hormone, some women who just get polycystic ovary syndrome. And they're probably on that spectrum, but they've not got the criteria for the diagnosis of polycystic ovary syndrome. OK, and and, and therefore, I do believe that there's there is a spectrum. And, and and that's what I say to somebody. You may well be on the very, very mild end of that spectrum. And, and the good news is, is that as long as you're growing and releasing eggs regularly, you know, your fertility will be normal. And those women with PCS who do grow and release eggs have normal fertility when they ovulate. So, so there is there is a spectrum, and I think there are people on the spectrum of PCOS that don't fulfill the criteria for, for PCOS. Um, th thanks very much, Professor Duncan. Um, and then uh, there, there are some questions. I'm sure this will be OK. Would it be possible to share your slides afterwards? We're happy to support and facilitate that if you're agreeable. And also, um, you know, some interest in looking at the study that you mentioned around weight loss. Is it possible we could get the link to that and circulate it to attendees afterwards? Would, would, you, would you be happy with that? Yes, I'll be happy with that, yeah. Great. Um, and so I'm just looking, we've got uh, a, a, a few other questions. And in fact, actually, while we're on the point of weight loss, I suppose one of the things people will be thinking about is um, the new sort of pills around weight loss. Is that something that you would recommend? Has there been evidence to support that around PCOS? Okay. Well, the first thing is, is that that weight loss pills are are, are, are probably uh, things which have not really worked in the past. But one of the things that people are excited about are the weight loss injections. And, and these weight loss injections are all over the media and you'll be reading lots and lots about the weight loss injections. And, and, and they do seem to work. They're, they're called GLP-1 agonists. That's just a, a type of weight loss. And what they do is they work in the brain. And what they do in the brain is to try to cut your appetite. And therefore, if you therefore, and they do succeed losing weight. Now, these weight loss drugs have been tested in PCOS, and they do seem to cause some weight loss. Now, whether or not that weight loss is quite as good as it is in those who, who uh, eat you know, more than they perhaps should do because of an increased appetite without PCOS is, is, you know, is difficult to do because most women with PCOS don't have problems with their appetite. If anything, people will say to me, I hardly eat at all and I really struggle really to lose weight. But certainly weight loss injections have been tested in PCOS. They tend to work 
you know, they work with, with regards to that. And there in England, these are available through the weight management service. I think that's been hopefully going to happen in Scotland. But but at the moment, PCOS is not one of the criteria that would su- that would suggest they might be useful. Well, other criteria might be, uh, you know, pending diabetes, diabetes or heart disease or something else. And, and it may well be we're, we'll have to look into that. But that's something that that is that is obviously ongoing. Thanks, Professor Duncan. And I suppose both to Professor Duncan and to Professor Glacier, we're hearing more and more about links between women um, and cardiac problems. And I'm wondering, and and there's a suggestion in the chat, are there any links between PCOS and heart health? And is there any more that we should be doing to raise awareness around this? I know, Anna, this is an area that you're interested in. Yes, so there is evidence that women with polycystic ovarian syndrome have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease in later life. Um, There isn't a system in Scotland for screening women for risk factors for cardiovascular disease. But I think it's probably fair to say that women who know they have polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, particularly as they get a bit of older as they reach 50 and beyond if they're going to see their GP for something and we all of us do go and see our GP from time to time for something even if it's unrelated to um, polycystic ovarian syndrome then it would be worth just asking if the practice nurse could check your blood pressure Um, and hopefully we may get some national screening system up and running if there is evidence that it's effective but whether you want to add anything colin yes i mean i think that that if you sort of look at the the the, the risk factors in polycystic ovary syndrome there's more likely to be increased problems with weight increased problem with fats in the blood increased problems with with blood pressure and and but that doesn't mean that everyone with polycystic ovary syndrome uh, is the same but 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 these are factors that we shouldn't ignore with regard to because of things that we can do about that to reduce cardiovascular risk in later life and i think it's it's raising awareness of that that's important and i think that that professor glaze you're championing that is, is is particularly helpful so that preventative approach actually tackles things across the board including diabetes heart health and so on and you you mentioned um the importance of exercise professor duncan um is that something that's uh, that weighs higher? I suppose exercise and weight loss come together, but you know, are there any studies that indicate um, you know the balance of weight loss as a factor in improvement okay. versus okay. Uh, treatment or other yeah. Uh, things? Yeah, exercise is, is particularly interesting, and in the fact that exercise by itself is not really that good. At losing weight, if you if you put a little bit of muscle on, that weighs a lot more than fat. So women who are exercising will sometimes see body shape changes. They'll maybe lose lose some clothes sizes without seeing the the effect of, of weight. But all of the studies that have looked at exercise have shown that the metabolic and hormone imbalance seem to get a little bit better. Some uh, doctors, when they're advising people to lose weight, say don't exercise. Okay. And that, that's, they're not daft. I'm not the same as that, but they're not daft. And what they, they realize is that sometimes when people exercise, they reward themselves because they feel good and they reward themselves with a little treat. And unfortunately, the calories in that treat are more than the calories that they lost during the exercise. So the, the answer is exercise without that reward. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yes, that's that's a, probably a good a good recommendation. Um, there are a few questions coming up, Professor Duncan, around the role of supplements, and I don't know if you're able to say this. I mean, there are various ones mentioned in the in the chat and the Q uh, the Q and A, but um, there's ones about myoinsulcital. And is that a reliable way to balance supplements? And there's some mention in the chat about magnesium, uh, berberine, um, and these being used, it it appears more often by uh, doctors in the US um, and people recommending this as a way to deal with um, PCOS. And there's also a question about, you know, if you do take these supplements, are you 
Are, does the fetus receive some of this and would that help to reduce um, in future daughters, for example, um, the incidence of PCOS? So I suppose, you know, is there a hereditary aspect to this? Okay, so th th these are, are really interesting questions. The first thing is about about uh, food supplements and, and, and the classic one is myoinosotol, which is, which is what you said. The problem with food supplements is that they they don't sort of come under the, the the drug regulation, and that means that that they they don't have to go through all the the full drug regulatory sorry, and there's not been really good studies. There's been anecdotal evidence for it, but there's not really been been good studies, and 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 I don't think any drug company is going to is is going to do these big studies because a lot of a lot of these. Um, uh, uh, things are more generic. Okay, so it's quite hard to put an awful lot of money into study that an, another drug company will just say, well, I'll use that. But certainly there is some evidence that it makes a, a little bit of difference. So I think that, and, and food supplements are certainly something that people use. My, my feeling about things is that if you're going to take something, the ideal thing to do, particularly with supplements, is, is, is that you're seeing a benefit from it. You know, and if you're not seeing a benefit, I don't think there's evidence that you should take something without seeing a benefit. Uh, and I, I, and so I think that the crucial thing is if you're seeing a benefit from it, then I don't think there's any evidence you're doing yourself any harm and there might be something that's doing good. But I wouldn't spend a lot of money on these supplements if you're not seeing anything that's tangible to, with regards to benefit. And there's certainly no way of evidence for prevention with, with, with food supplements. The other thing is is interesting. It's about... Uh, it's about hereditary elements of PCOS. Now, we know that PCOS runs in families, and we know that if you look at non-identical twins and identical twins, PCOS is slightly more concordant in identical twins and non-identical twins. And that means that there are some genetic elements of PCOS. But despite all of the huge amount of research into genetics of PCOS, uh, they've found genes that can maybe account for about 5% or 10% at the very most of PCOS. So most of PCOS might not necessarily be genetic in nature. Um, there's, there's still a lot of people looking for the genetic causes. It certainly does run in families. And we, we do know that, that when you research that, that some of the, uh, the preclinical models of, that, of PCOS involve the fetus being exposed to a little bit extra male type hormone. And we do know that during pregnancy, uh, women with PCOS have a little bit of extra male type hormone, and it may be that that's how that can be passed on. But it's very difficult to know because the placenta spends a lot of the time stopping the, the baby getting, getting exposed to all these things. So, so we don't really fully understand how PCOS is passed on, but it might not entirely be uh, genetics. Is there something that we can do that is going to sort of stop that being passed on? That's very hard because one of the things that we've learned in the past is that sometimes when you give pregnant women some things, you have unexpected outcomes of the of the pregnancy, particularly as that parent pregnancy grows up. So I think that it's very difficult to sort of talk about prevention and and preventing um, things. That are that are going to happen by taking medication during pregnancy. There's certainly no evidence that we should be doing that, or any evidence of what to do. As far as you know, our research is concerned, one of the things that we've we've discovered is, is that there might be a window in children that we could that we if we could work out those children that are on the spectrum PCOS, there might be something we could do at that stage that will perhaps stop them developing the full PCOS later on. But th th this is still very, very experimental and 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 way from being um, anywhere near being put into practice. Thanks very much. Um, I mean, I think this will be quite an easy question for you to answer, but there is a question in the chat about any links to ovarian cancer. Are okay. there any okay. links so, to ovarian so, cancer? So, so the answer is the answer is no. OK, so there are no links with PCOS with ovarian cancer. And I think that that's 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 very clear. The, sort of the, the, when it comes down to sort of uh, uh, cancer, the only real really link with a with PCOS is the cancer of the lining of the womb. And that's why it's important. And that's because that estrogen can grow the lining, grow the lining, grow the lining. Sometimes it gets a little bit out of control. 
And that means it's really important to protect the lining of the womb by ensuring that progesterone is available to allow you to have either no periods or periods three or four times a year, depending on the type of progesterone you're using. Okay, well, well, thank you very much. And we still do have quite a lot of questions, but I'm conscious of the time. And I kind of wanted to end um, with a few more sort of generalist questions around how do you get support? Um, you know, can you access specialist support on the NHS? Is the route to that through your GP? And is there any sort of guidance, I mean, that you could summarise that people should prepare in advance of a GP meeting, you know, the kind of things that they should draw to their GP's attention? Um, and is that the correct route to get specialist help on the NHS? Or really, is, is there no specialist help? Is it solely through primary care? Okay. So I think that the, the, the first thing to say is that there are, uh, you'll always worry about the internet because there's a lot of misinformation out there, but there actually is a lot of good information out there as well. And and and, and there are some good uh, NHS inform sites that are good NHS sites that give information. There's also uh, charities that have got very good um, websites. So you're thinking of, of Verity, perhaps. Sort of. And so there are charities that can help and they've got good information. When it comes down to sort of uh, medical help, then then primary care is the first port of call and 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 those with PCOS don't need to come to see a specialist in PCOS some people do particularly if they're if if they've got some um if particularly with fertility issues or if they're a bit more complicated or they need a bit more time i think that one thing about general practice is it's it's very hard for general practitioners a lot easier for me who's got a lot more time you know, with the patient. I think when it comes down to general uh, practitioners, then then obviously there are these three things. Now, the general practitioners don't have access to a scan, which is which is what I do in my clinic day in and day out. I don't send people for a scan. I do scans because because the scans that are being done sort of, uh, of the ovaries are not really designed to focus on whether this ovary is polycystic or not. So, uh, but, but what they have is a history and ability to do of a, a blood test. So menstrual history is quite important. So, so knowing, you know, what, what the periods are like, the, the, the shortest time between a period, the longest time on an average time is is, is, is quite a useful thing to, to know. And if there is any any issues with regards to extra hairs or spots, these are these are useful to know. One of the things it's important to say is, is that some things can mimic PCOS. So 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 sometimes we need to check or thyroid problems. Sometimes we have to check for adrenal problems as well. But most of the time, you can do that with just with just speaking to the patient. But sometimes we have to do some additional blood tests as well. Thank you. Thank thank you very much, Professor Duncan. Um, Anna, just in closing, um, I mean, we as an organisation are very um, supportive of a self-management approach. And I think we've been given so much information today that would certainly help support and assist people with that so that they, they understand their condition, they have the right information to have shared discussions um, with primary care, uh, multidisciplinary teams. Um, and, and we also talk a lot about person-centred approaches uh, to health and well-being because everyone's an individual and um, no two cases are exactly the same. So any closing thoughts, Anna, on you know how, how we go forward in, in further raising awareness, how we ensure that person-centred care and support and, and maybe the role of self-management um, and shared decision-making in um, in promoting women's health? Yes, so I think, Irene, you've just summed up the Women's Health Plan in about three sentences. Um, that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, you know, we want realistic medicine. We want to encourage people to have shared decision-making but to have realistic expectations of what the NHS can do for them. And I think, as you said, self-management is very important. Professor Duncan has made it extremely clear that losing weight is a real cornerstone of the management of polycystic ovarian syndrome. 
And let's face it, we all of us feel better if we lose weight. Um, and to do that, we either have to eat a wee bit less or take more exercise or preferably do both. But I think perhaps, again, there's a tendency if people are told, well, you'll feel better if you lose weight, again, to feel that they're being fobbed off. So I think it's very helpful that Professor Duncan has explained why it is that women with polycystic ovarian syndrome uh, find it more difficult to lose weight than women who don't have polycystic ovarian syndrome and how important that, that the weight factor is that if you gain weight, your PCOS will get worse. If you lose weight, your PCOS will get better. So I think this webinar is going to be available at any time for people to listen to. So people can listen to it again if there are bits which aren't all that clear or which they haven't completely understood. And again, I echo what Professor Duncan has said that the NHS Inform website is very helpful on polycystic ovarian syndrome. In fact, the NHS Inform, I'm going to give this a plug, NHS Inform is where we should all be going when we want to find anything out about health. If we have anything, any questions about health, don't go to Google, go to NHS Inform as the first port of call, and then take it from there. Um, and I think if, if this webinar has helped the general public have a better understanding of what PCOS is, what it isn't, and what can be done to help it, then that will be great. And I think, judging from the chat, there are quite a few healthcare providers that have also um, tuned into the webinar. And I don't know whether there's a, there's a facility, Irene, for Colin to go through the questions that have come in from healthcare providers to give quick advice to them at no charge uh, at the end of the webinar. Yes, thanks very much, um, Professor Glacier. And, and also to, to mention to people on the call that we do have a women's stakeholder group and a women's newsletter. And if you'd like to, if you're not already registered for that, then um, please get in touch with us. We'd be happy to put you on our mailing list for future sessions um, around other items and topics related to women's health and, and um, to receive a copy of our newsletter. And, and so with those uh, closing remarks, can I sincerely thank firstly all of you for coming along and attending today. Um, Professor Duncan, I see, you know, uh, huge compliments in the in the chat about um, how, how you've taken so many questions and how well you've explained uh, in, in an understandable way. Uh, and given so much information out to people. So thank you so much for that. And um, Professor Glacier for, for really introducing us to this topic and making it one of your priorities. And as you said at the beginning, making sure that women uh, in this maybe under misunderstood area um, have a voice as well and um, you know ha have a place to to bring concerns about what we've all agreed is a very complicated area so thank you for supporting us in the initiative today and also particular to your team Sarah Shoba and my team Jennifer for all the work they've put into making today happen and I think with that we've just about finished on time um, so thank you everyone for more information, see the links in the description box.